So you might have noticed that I'm not that young, and back when I was in university, we used to discuss a lot about how to apply engineering principle to software design patterns. And while nowadays a lot of the discussion seems to be about which game engine is better or what frameworks to use in JavaScript, back in my days, we used to talk a lot about software design patterns, and especially the gang of four. And I often see these design patterns described in their pure form. They're kind of like a spherical cow in the vacuum. Very useful for understanding the general principle of the pattern, but it's not really applicable in most real world problem. If you spend enough time thinking or designing or working with those design pattern, you start to understand their strengths and their weaknesses and the reason why each of those attributes are part of the pattern. And then you can twist and turn and change the pattern to make it work better for your own needs. So today I want to talk about some of the common architectures I've worked with in the past, what I liked about them, what I disliked about them, and how you can adjust them to fit your needs. So let's start with the elephant in the room, object-oriented programming, aka OOP, which is mostly what I was taught in university. You take a problem, break it down in simple real-world object, wrap those objects into classes, put the state and the behavior of those objects inside the classes, and then remove code duplication using inheritance. Nowadays, I rarely see the pure object-oriented approach. Most people I know have given up on modeling everything on real-world object, but you still see the legacy of OOP in a lot of programming languages that uses class and private public member and methods and so on. I don't really have a problem with most of these. The real problem is more around polymorphism. If you have a very deep class hierarchy, you're going to run into a whole bunch of problems. The most classic example of a real game I worked on is having a class for each different types of vehicle. So we had a Mustang class, a Boeing 747 class, and you know, a yacht class or something. And each of these inherited from like car class and a boat class and airplane class. And then, you know, these inherited from vehicle and the vehicle of course inherited from some kind of global game object. The problem happens when you have like a hovercraft, which is both a boat and a car. So like, where do you put, put the code now? Do you put all the code for floating into some into your vehicle cl class so that everyone can use it? Or do you put an in-between class called bouillon class where you, know, you put your car and your boat class so that they can all inherit from the code to float on water? But then what happens when you have a float plane that can fly, be on the water, or drive on the road? Like, now it gets really messy, you know? And you could have solved all of this by simply using more like a composition, you know? You could have a Boolean class, but you just attach it to any object that can float. So now you can compose objects without having to deal with all the inheritance stuff. So in general, I would say, try to avoid having more than maybe three level of inheritance. Like, I think it's very, very good idea to have one single object for your whole game or your whole architecture so that you can have really, really, really high level common interface for all your items in your game or your, you know, project or whatever. But more than two deep or three deep, that's probably getting dangerous. Doesn't mean it's impossible, it's just my own recommendation. Next is functional programming, which is often described as the opposite of OOP or that thing that mathematicians like. But I think it's much more common than people think. All of the link library in C-sharp is just basically functional. Um, a lot of the new concepts in JavaScript like promises and closure are all implementing functional concepts. The um, definition on Wikipedia is kind of hard to understand for me. I'm not sure why. But basically, the, the core idea is just to use functions like a data type, like an int or a float. You know, you can pass them around, you can assign them, you can execute them, you can read their value and all that. And this opens the door to a lot of very interesting possibilities. 
Now in the pure version, you should never access anything outside of your function. Everything should always be passed as argument and you should never modify any state outside of your function. This can get really tricky in a lot of situations. For example, I wouldn't be able to imagine how to make a game engine purely using pure functional programming because you'd have to pass the state of the whole game throughout all your functions that you're calling. And that just doesn't seem very nice. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that it would be a pain. But where functional programming really shines is when you want to execute something on a small subset of data. For example, if you want to filter a list or if you want to um, execute some kind of code based on every entry in an array or something, functional programming can make a very complex problem much, much, much simpler to handle than it looks like. And I would recommend that anytime you want to manipulate some kind of data structure, look a little bit into functional programming you might find it very useful. Next is one of my favorite, ECS, Entity Component System. It's not quite as high level as the previous two, but it's still something that will completely change the way you approach or design your project architecture. Just look at Unity's Dutch ecosystem. It's like a whole different Unity, basically. Historically, it's been designed so that you can align objects in memory to perform really fancy cache optimization to get a lot of performance out of modern um, CPU architecture. To do that, you build an entity by instantiating a bunch of components that have various attributes. For example, you could have a physics component that has mass, velocity, and collision shape. Then you collect, for example, all your physics components into a single array and you pass it to a physics system that will iterate over them and execute the physics steps for each of your entity. This is very powerful because technically all the structures are contiguous in memory, optimizing the cache access for the physics system. But to be honest, I never care about cache locality when I'm using ECS. This is the kind of stuff you really care about if you're working in a AAA studio and optimizing for performance or you're making your own game engine from scratch. No, I like the ECS for its kind of unintended consequence. Because you're forced to separate the data into those data structure, you end up separating the logic from the data, which in a game is something incredibly powerful because most of the time, the game data will be manipulated by artists or game designers, which are not programmer. And so it gives them powerful tool for composing things without having to know how everything works. For example, instead of having a player character class or something, you just have a player entity, which is composed of a bunch of components that the game designer can themselves specify. Um, you could have, for example, a graphics component and a physics component. And if the game designer decides that entity A has both of those, then you have an object that has a real physical world presence and has a visual. But if entity B just has a graphics component and no physics component, then this object will be visible, but it won't have any collision. Now, there's a couple of tricky parts when you're tackling things as components. First is how do you decide what should be a component or not? You're making a car. Is the wheel a component or is the wheel and the suspension a wheel assembly component? It's, it can be hard to decide and really there's no good answer. It really depends on what you're making and how you're approaching the problem. Next, there's also that since your systems are kind of isolated, sometimes it can be difficult to make them talk to each other. I like to use global signals for that, but it can be difficult if you want to get a reply from one of the system. And also if you're working on a bigger project, having like thousands of global events can become a little bit hard to manage. I've also had an interesting problem recently where I was trying to create a behavior tree AI and I ran into a problem because my data is basically little pieces of logic. You know, I want the AI to go to sleep. I want the AI to eat. I want the AI to walk outside. These are kind of difficult to represent as data structure and the ECS doesn't really work well if you want to put logic inside your component. So I would say, try out the ECS pattern, but not if you're trying to make a huge behavior tree. Maybe don't start with that. 
Next is the Model View Controller, MVC. It's the poster child of web development, mostly because of Ruby on Rails. It sits about at the same level of ECS, but instead of trying to separate the logic from the data, it's trying to separate the visuals from the data that they call the model. Now, while doing research for this video, I found a lot of weird diagrams about what is MVC. Um, but the way I was taught is that you have a bunch of views and when the user interact with those views, it sends requests to one or more controllers and these controllers will modify the model which contains all the data for your project, which is usually backed by a database. And then when the model data changes, it'll send events back up to the views to update the renders. I've always felt a little bit weird about how MVC separates things. For me, it makes more sense to separate the logic from the data. But of course, in a web application, it's true that all the rendering happens on the client while all the data lives in the backend. So you need this kind of separation anyway. But I still don't really like how the MVC does it. First, the controller ends up often being this kind of weird monster where everything goes and it's kind of hard to break it down. Like when your customer makes a purchase, should it go to your customer controller or does it go to your inventory controller? Or do you have a specific purchase controller? It's not clear and it's not easy to follow, I think. And the idea that the model should be sending events to update the view sounds good in theory, but in my experience, the views are very dependent on the data and very coupled with it. So trying to abstract that doesn't really serve any purpose. Still, I think you see some of the legacy of the MVC pattern in a lot of web development nowadays with, you know, events to drive a uh, visual refresh in a lot of JavaScript frameworks and using a router to route requests from the web to your backend is something that you see now in every kind of microservice architecture. But in general, the pure MVC pattern is not something I really like to use. Finally, recently I've been working on a project that uses something called CQRS plus ES, which stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation with Event Sourcing, which is a mouthful. This one is also an architectural pattern that's trying to orchestrate how different parts of your system should talk to each other in a large project. Now we had the ECS that's trying to separate data from logic, and we had the MVC trying to separate visuals from data. Now CQRS is a little bit more abstract. It's trying to separate responsibilities into aggregates and commands. So a user would, for example, issue a command. This command would be put into some kind of queue, which then gets processed and stored into a sort of database. Now, a centralized queue is kind of interesting because it makes it easy to create some command subscriber that listens to changes on your command queue and then other parts of your system can use these events to, you know, react to the changes. For example, because in domain-driven design, aggregates should never talk to each other, if you need to orchestrate changes across multiple aggregates, it's recommended to create something called a process manager. So the process manager would listen to event from the command subscriber, and then it can generate new commands on other aggregates across your system. The query part in CQRS comes from the idea that you can have a whole completely separate system listening to those commands and updating a read-only database that is just for the visuals. This is especially powerful because there's a lot of large systems that will have completely different needs between the write side and the read side. You can imagine, for example, Twitter, where writing a tweet is a completely different process than just loading up Twitter to read a bunch of tweets from people you're following. Like the two are completely different and having them as separate processes, it can be very powerful. The event sourcing part is to further divide the commands into smaller events. 
that can be used for synchronization, backup, or more complex processes. For example, adding a customer might be something very complicated. So when you issue an add customer command, you might divide it into like a pre-add customer, a save customer, and then a post-add customer or something like that. And the idea is that you write those kind of temporary events into an event store, and then once only everything has been validated and completed, get, do you forward everything into your permanent storage. Now, to be honest, the only part I like about the CQRS is the separation between the read and write side. And even this is only useful in some very specific cases. While I understand the goal of each of those sections, I kind of don't understand how this design architecture really helps you achieve those goals. I mean, when you want to add a new command, you basically have to touch every single part of these boxes, which kind of seems insane to me. It'd be all right if it helped you prevent some kind of problems or validate your system or something. But the reality of what I've experienced is that it's as easy to mess up a command as it is to, say, mess up a direct query to the database. That said, this is definitely the design pattern I have the less experience with, so there might be some stuff I just don't understand, and I would really love to understand and appreciate this design pattern as much as I like ACS or I used to love uh, object-oriented programming. But right now it just kind of rubs me the wrong way, a little bit like MVC. But if you think I've got something wrong and you have a good example of how things should work, please make sure to leave a comment below or even join my Discord and then let's have a chat because I'm always willing to learn new stuff. In general, I think I like patterns that teach us more how computer works and how to adapt problems to the computer architecture instead of patterns that try to take the real world and model it into a computer. That's why I like the ECS because its pure form is really to optimize for the computer memory ar architecture, where things like MVC, object-oriented programming, they're trying to take real-world knowledge and apply it to computer software design. And I feel this is not really performant. This forces us to do all sorts of weird, weird hacks to get it to work. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed and see you all in my next episode. Bye.